the Latin word. We're good? Yeah. There we go. Okay, I guess we can get started. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's great to have you all here. It's great to be in Chicago. Uh, I love the city. I'm originally from Wisconsin. Um, so I'm Cisco Bradley, by the way. Uh, so uh, I'm here to read a, you know, a portion of uh, my new book, The Williamsburg Avant-Garde, uh, Experimental Music and Sound on the Brooklyn Waterfront. And uh, I have another book, actually both the books in the back there, if you're interested, they're 30 bucks. Um, I wrote uh, William Parker's biography, and that's also a few copies back there. So cool. I'm happy to sign copies at the end. Um, so appreciate you all coming out, and you know, we're going to uh, dig into the book. I, uh, I thought I'd just start by talking a little bit about the process of writing a book about the Brooklyn experimental scene. Um, and then I'll read some sections, and I'm going to ask uh, John Ravigan and Weasel Walter to come and join me on stage, and we're going to just talk about Brooklyn scene for, for a little bit, and then we can do some questions, and then, and then I'll get out of here, and then you guys get to all hear uh, them play. I'm really excited. Uh, bass saxophone. I, I, mean, I, I don't know what to expect, so it's, Yay. it's pretty exciting. Good um, so, you know, I, uh, around 2012, uh, not just like a year after I moved back to New York, I had been hanging around the scene in New York, uh, especially in Brooklyn, and got thinking that Maybe it would be a good idea to write a book about, you know, a lot of the improvised, experimental music, free jazz, kind of all the stuff that was happening in Brooklyn. And, uh, you, know, it's, it, you know, living there, I feel like I was going to, I don't know, three or four shows a week for a while. Um, and just wanted to, to do something. So I, the first thing I did actually was start a, a website called jazzrightnow.com, um, which I kind of always regret putting jazz in title. Nothing against jazz, but it covers a lot of other music too. I just tried to cover a wide array of things happening in Brooklyn at the time, um, and then uh, began working on this book. And um, originally, I was thinking I was going to write a book about the entirety of the Brooklyn scene, you know, kind of from the '80s to the present, just kind of cover the whole thing, and then. After, I don't know, a year or something, I realized you know, fairly quickly that there was just too much to cover, in a way. And it's just, so much stuff has been happening over the years. So, uh, just, with this, what I tried to do is go back and basically go to the root of the emergence of an experimental music scene in Brooklyn, as opposed to Manhattan. So, uh, you know, Manhattan obviously had been the epicenter for a long, long time. Um, and then with gentrification kind of really hitting the Lower East Side, the East Village, where so many artists lived and so many venues were located. Uh, artists who were moving to uh, the city, uh, New York City in um, early, early 90s, mid 90s, just stopped moving to Manhattan. It just wasn't really possible anymore, and people started moving to Brooklyn. And the, the neighborhood of Williamsburg in particular, um, which is, you know, if, I don't know if you're probably all familiar with it, but you know, sort of situated right along the water uh, right on the other side of the river from the East Village. So you literally can take the L train from the East Village in one stop and you're in Williamsburg. It just goes under the river. So um, so from the, really from the late 80s on, um, there developed a community there. Um, and I think it, you know, kind of some somewhat unique circumstances, I, especially given what the city has become. I mean, I think now it's so massively overdeveloped. Uh, gentrified to the absolute max. Uh, I mean, buildings that you know 50 years ago might have been sold for forty thousand dollars today are selling for 1.8 million. It just, I mean, it's, it's completely crazy. Um, but there was this sort of moment in Williamsburg where, um, where people could get lots of space for cheap. Uh, and a lot of artists moved there. And it was in a neighborhood at, which at the time was not seen as a desirable neighborhood. So Williamsburg being kind of the waste processing center for the entire city. Like the entire city would send its trash to Williamsburg and it would be processed in various ways. 
and you know the Newtown Creek, which kind of cuts through Williamsburg there, or Greenpoint, kind of I think between Greenpoint and Williamsburg, you know, it's a sort of a notoriously radioactive, toxic, you know, waste dump, um, which I think they they realize if they just paved over it, it's better than trying to dredge it out. So, um, so I mean, you know, like it has this sort of post-industrial, you know, it's post-industrial landscape. Uh, Williamsburg had these massive warehouses, most of which had not been used in decades. Uh, most of that stuff had closed up in the 60s and 70s. Um, and that's where artists began doing their work. So um, when I was doing this project, and I felt like I kept kind of, oh, I don't know, I almost felt like archaeology. Like I was uncovering another layer as I tried to go further and further back. Um, and so, you know, in the process of this, um, I had. Uh, I think I interviewed 182 people uh, for the book. Uh, I didn't know that starting out, so I think if I had, I probably wouldn't have done it. It's a crazy number of people to try to interview. But um, I felt like it's just one of those things. I, I started interviewing people who were active presently, and then, you know, as I went, eventually I was, you know, encountering people who no longer lived in uh, New York. A lot of a lot of them, anyway. Um, you know, I, I interviewed people who were living in Bangkok, Thailand, or you know. Berlin or just wherever you know, people have gone and left, you know, moved elsewhere. So, uh, if you spend time in that part of Brooklyn now, I mean, it's this hyper gentrified place. It sort of it feels post apocalyptic in like the opposite way from when I'm there. I I, I began. I was, I was trying to figure out where all the venues were because I mean, it, from the '80s until the early 2000s, was this growth of venues. And you had like warehouses, uh, lofts. Uh, bars, uh, kind of you know various types of. I mean a lot of type, a lot of loft types of spaces, warehouse spaces, um, venues that were mostly unlicensed. Um, the big spoiler that I'll give you: if I get to the end of the book and I say, well, most of the most of the performances that I talk about were technically illegal. So, um, part of the commentary in the book is 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 the you know. You know, basically critiquing the lack of you know lack of public support for the arts generally uh, for music. I think in particular because um, I think of all the transformations in the music industry in the past thirty years has made it you know much more difficult. I think for for people to make a living as as uh, musicians, uh, even though that's I think what this country does best. I guess you know make music. So. Uh, I think the, you know, in, in all the venues, I mean, artists had access to space. I mean, imagine having 30,000 square feet of warehouse space for maybe, for maybe for literally nothing because you were squatting the building and the, the landlords lived in Florida and they didn't even know you were there. Like there were warehouse shows happening like that. Or maybe people would rent, you know, a space out for a month and do some huge warehouse, you know, you know, visual art, performance art, music. And like that. So these kinds of events, you know, built a lot of momentum and uh, from the late '80s into the early 2000s. Um, Williamsburg also inherited the punk community from the East Village when people were pushed out in the late '80s, uh, kind of in the, the one of the sort of famous clashes between police and. Uh, people were squatting buildings in the East Village. And punks got up and moved over to Williamsburg, kind of brought that. So that there was that you know, element. There were, you know, there were painters who had been already living there. There were a lot of different kinds of musicians working there. So the community grew out of that. And it's kind of hard. It's hard to imagine how quickly things changed in Williamsburg because, I mean, as late as 1999, and numerous people talking about how you had to be careful of the packs of wild dogs that hung out on Kent Avenue because they might attack you. So if you saw the dogs, you would you know, go down, go around, you know, take another route. So I mean, there's stories like that that just seem impossible. Like even just a few years later where, you know, rents were rising and uh, so forth. So, um, so anyway, uh, that's just a bit of background information. Um, the book looks in the earlier period at a lot of venues uh, up to about 2005 when there was a rezoning instituted by the mayor, which rezoned much of Williamsburg from being industrial 
to being residential, which meant developers could move in and, and turn warehouses into condos or, or just knock buildings over. And, um, and where the kind of the site where one of the one of the main sites where the Williamsburg scene began in 1988 or 1990 around that time, uh, with people doing shows outside on the loading docks of a warehouse behind um, you know, that faced the river, um, those buildings were were torn down. That's where the massive uh, luxury condos are. Um, so writing the book was in a lot of ways, it was, I don't know, I'm sort of trying to reconstruct and maybe at my own level kind of experience the, the music that I hadn't been there for. I mean, I didn't get, I didn't move back to, I moved to New York in 2000, then moved away and came back in 2011. I missed a lot of them. Um, but it was also kind of haunting, you know, to, to, to walk around a neighborhood where every, every block or two used to have a venue, you know, even whether it was a bar or a, uh, an artist loft or whatever, and none of it's there. In most cases, not a, not only are the venues gone, the buildings are gone. So you know, like the, the entire landscape has changed. Um, so anyway, that's that's kind of all in the background. But much of the book kind of looks at a, you know a successive wave of venues and the artists' communities that formed around them, and the and the the, the various experimental music that, that occurred in those spaces. So I'm going to actually. I'm just going to read a couple sections, and I'm going to, I'm going to have John and Weasel join me. Um, I'm going to actually just focus on the very last venue, one of, one of my favorite music venues ever, which is Death by Audio. So if any of you were in Williamsburg between was it, 2007 and 2014, it's amazing the venue lasted seven years. Um, so in a lot of ways, I feel like it was sort of like a classic punk venue, a lot of, you know, I mean, whether it's you know, sort of murals on the walls, or graffiti, or, you know, just, you know, like the, like the, the ceiling tiles coming off from the ceiling, you know, just it kind of had that vibe to it, but it was, it was just such a great space for music, and, and almost anything could have kind of happened there, so. Um, so I'm just going to read a little description about Death by Audio, and then I'm going to jump in, read a couple of sections about, because uh, both the musicians that are playing tonight played in this, uh, in this venue quite a bit. The Audio, located at 49 South 2nd Street, was the last great DIY venue in Williamsburg. It opened in the spring of 2007 and became the core of an underground scene that was a fertile site for experimentation as improvised music collided with rock, punk, metal, and noise. The club came directly out of the punk aesthetic, with every inch of the interior painted, graffitied, or covered in band stickers. At one end, there was a makeshift stage in a room that could hold 75 people with an adjoining room in the back for overflow that also had a speakeasy bar. When I say a speakeasy bar, I think there was a, like a fold-out table with a cooler behind it. That's what I remember, at least that's when, when I was there. Um, and just a couple, you know, a couple kinds of beer, maybe a couple kinds of liquor. Um, and I, I believe everything about the venue was, was unlicensed, and yeah, I mean, that's, all, that's all, all where all the great music was happening, in places like this. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, sometimes these kinds of venues, it all it takes is a person who's organized, a person who wants to make something happen, and then finding the right, you know, bringing in musicians who, are, you know, who, who want to be a part of it. Um, for a lot of us, multi-instrumentalists, Weasel Walter explained, Death by Audio was a place where they understood what we were doing and they welcomed us, whether we had a good night or not. We could do whatever we wanted, book whoever we wanted, and the sound was okay. They paid us and people showed up. That's what it, that's what it takes to make a scene happen. And I, that might seem like simple components, but I feel like a lot of times those are missing in a lot of places and you know, plenty of venues um, you know, that, that you know, don't provide that kind of thing. Um, Death by Audio was one of the most important venues for the development of music that Walter uh, had termed brutal prog back in 2000 to delineate bands that were more focused on dissonance and intensity than other forms of progressive rock. Incorporating elements of progressive rock, punk, post-punk, no wave, free jazz, math rock, heavy metal, grindcore, and Japanese noise, brutal prog was loud, aggressive, and challenging to audiences. Walter's own band, the Flying Lutenbachers, founded in Chicago in 1992, was one of the forerunners of the music. So he coined the term in reference to the lineup that he assembled for the record Inflection, in, Infection and Decline in 2001, which included Alex Perkalope and Jonathan Hischke on basses, 
I was trying to create a clear-cut distinction of what we were doing with progressive rock forms, minus the sort of flutes and fairies elements I didn't like in Prague, Walter stated. The balladry and sensitivity, the balladry and sensitivity were banished from our kingdom. Asymmetry, dissonance, and speed ruled. So, you know, Death by Auto became one of these, became in a lot of ways, I think, one of the, one of the national kind of epicenters for this whole, uh, this whole era of, of uh, but I guess more aggressive, louder, um, improvised music. Um, so, one of the main avant-garde bands to emerge, and I, I, I use avant-garde very loosely in the book. Um, one of the, the main avant-garde bands to emerge at Death Bay Audio in its early years was the Mark Edwards Weasel Walter group. Edwards was a generation older than Walter and had emerged in the 1970s playing with eminent f uh, free jazz figures such as pianist Cecil Taylor and saxophonist David S. Ware and later with Charles Gale in the 1980s and 1990s. Nevertheless, Edwards remained an underground figure, and what visibility he had, he had emerged, <clears throat> and what visibility he had attained had faded by the 2000s. Walter, also primarily a drummer, had emerged in the early 90s on the Chicago improvised music scene with mutual interests in free jazz, such as the work of Albert Eiler, Cecil Taylor, and Archie Shepp, and punk rock. Quote, I was always into, equally into Albert Eiler and death metal. Uh, Walter later noted. It's like one of my favorite quotes in the book. Um, he founded the band The Flying Ludenbachers in 1992 and played with them for over a decade, releasing a series of groundbreaking records. He later moved to San Francisco in 2003, where he reconstituted the band. His music blended elements of free jazz, no wave, and art rock, glued together with a punk energy, and gave a loud, aggressive edge to it. That gave a loud, a loud, aggressive edge to its sound. Walter was attracted to Edward's work with Taylor in particular, and eventually sought him, sought him out because of Edward's work as a power free jazz drummer. I never want music to be a sterile experience, Walter explained of his craft. I also don't like the insularity of art. I make music to be part of the dialogue with or against society. I've always found myself fighting against the mainstream and the status quo. I was into free jazz as a teenager because I thought it was a way to articulate individuality and maybe aggression, which I also found in punk rock sometimes. This kind of music allows me to focus on the quality of, me, of the music and the relationships with the other musicians and, and the power of the action. A lot of my inspiration in free jazz were people who did not fit into society, Walter stated. My inspirations mostly didn't go to expensive schools to get advanced degrees in improvisation. They were people who had a, a, a real urge to do something different and express themselves. I thought of people like Cecil Taylor, Albert Eiler, and Ornette Coleman as extreme iconoclasts. In a way, my mission has been to make iconoclastic music. I try to speak to other iconoclasts with this in an era of conformity to create a powerful experience. Then there are ins inspirations like Ioannis Xenakis. He articulated the same kind of frenzy, aggression, ab and abstraction that I am interested in. People might say his music was very academic, but his music is warlike in demeanor because he got half of his face shot off fighting in the resistance against the Nazis. Edwards was surprised when he received a message from Walter via MySpace. <laughs> I knew that would get some. That's, that's, that's like the best joke in the book. Uh, in early 2007, inviting him to join Walter for a gig at Tonic because Edwards had not had a presence on the New York scene since the early 90s. The show at Tonic was their first encounter, and, and their shared ecstatic energy and intensity compelled them to consider working together again. Walter described his performances as irritainment, the nexus between irritating and entertainment. <laughs> his approach involved high punk energy, which was matched by Edwards, who also played a high, at high speeds and intensity, laying down a maelstrom of beats that created textures, even entire environments of sound, in which horns and other instruments could add color or try to push the energy higher. Edwards' use, Edwards use of, of a double bass drum pedal transformed his sound and enabled him to elevate his rhythmic intensity to a level he had not had in earlier years as a jazz drummer. Over the, over the following six years, the band played often in New York, regularly shifting the lineups, but co-led by the two drummers. At their first gig at St. Vitus, a heavy metal club in Greenpoint, Walter provided written instruction on how to, get, how to set up the, imp the improvisations that, according to Edwards, was similar to Cecil Taylor's approach, though without specific notes for musicians to play. At times, Walter would step away from drumming and engage in his own form of conduction to direct the horn players, especially when the band 
was in one of its larger formations with the effect of making the music even more intense by creating r room for solos or focusing on particular mu <clears throat> musical interactions within the band. In May 2008, Walter and Edwards invited a third drummer, Andrew Barker, to add to the high energy rhythmic com complexity with a front line that included Ross Moshe and Mario Rectern at the Lit Lounge. Barker meshed seamlessly with our drumming concepts, Edwards recalled of the encounter, though logic, but logistically it was difficult to accommodate three drummers in most venues. And they never attempted the lineup again. They continued to experiment with lineups that included a range of figures, such as trumpeter Peter Evans, saxophonist Paul Flaherty and Darius Jones, and bassist Tom, Tom Blankart. Then in April 2009, they assembled a group at Otto's Shrunken Head in Manhattan that finally coalesced around the music. The band retained Darius Jones, but added saxophonist Elliot Levin, trumpeter Forbes Graham, and bassist Adam Lane. The high level of musicianship in the band played a role in compelling Walter to move to New York later that year, and the band recorded in November, soon after his arrival. Edwards commented, I had spent the year practicing for this session. From that point on, the band began playing regularly around the city and clubs, a few remaining Williamsburg lofts at Zebulon, at Silent Barn, um, and finally at Death by Audio in October 2010. Eden Wilbur, who was the, the, the guy that ran uh, Death by Audio, did not like free jazz, Walter recall. But once he heard us, I think he thought of us as a noise band. After that, he always trusts, uh, trusted us to bring something interesting to the club. In a way, No Wave had been the harbinger of a type of fusion uh, between abstract free jazz and improvisational aesthetics and punk rock and served a as a rallying cry for Walter as he contributed to the vision for the band. For Walter, the music that he made with Edwards was an attempt to get back to what I thought the point of music was, but not to do it in an old-fashioned way. At the same time, I thought there were some great older musicians that still had something to say, like Mark Edwards and Elliot Levin. Uh, <clears throat> they, they would probably not have put it in a rock venue like Death by Audio. Presenting high-intensity free jazz at that club was my way of bringing <clears throat> it into a new space for a new audience and bringing a current energy to it. The racial and generational integration of the band seemed to be a conscious design for Walter, who, who stated, those kinds of fusions are really exciting <clears throat> and possible in a, in a place like New York. By June 2010, the band was c condensed to a trio, which was more manageable and easier to sustain financially. The smaller lineup featured Marcus Cummins on soprano saxophone, and, and Walter shifted to electric bass, a formation they maintained for most of the remaining years that the band was together. They played at least monthly through 2010 and 2011, refining their concepts. For a performance in November 2011 at Freddy's Bar in South Brooklyn, they added tenor saxophonist Jeremy Viner to give it a more robust sound, and they re recorded the live set and released the record on Walter's label, Ugg Explode. Later in the month, they performed at the Stone with free jazz luminary Sabir Mateen and Roy Campbell Jr., though they returned to the trio and quartet formats generally at Death by Audio in 2012, with saxophonist Michael Foster guesting regularly in the lineup. The band played its final concerts in June 2013. Walter had grown tired of playing innovative music without much of an audience beyond a, 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 the North Brooklyn venues, and he turned his full attention to the band's cellular chaos which was exploring brutal, brutal prog a bit more directly. So, and I also talk about that then in, in, the, in, the in, the, in the book. Uh, but I want to switch and talk, just uh, read a section about um, one of John Arabagon's bands uh, that I've admired for a long time. I think I was listening to even before I met you. Uh, such a great, such a great group, but I, I love how to see the, how the bands continue to evolve now. Um, it's the band, I Don't Hear Nothing But The Blues. I Don't Hear Nothing But The Blues grew out of, a, out of duo sessions that, are, that John Arabigan and Mike Pride did at, at Pride's apartment in, Win, in the Windsor Terrace neighborhood in 2006. Um, we really enjoyed playing together, sometimes just us, sometimes we, we would invite other people to join us, hear Arabigan describe the process. At times we would each bring compositions, while at other times we just played free. It was a, work, it was a workshop for us to bounce ideas off of each other and try new things. As Pride was about to embark on a three-month world tour with another band in 2008, they finally went into the studio to record material for their self-titled debut record. 
The record exhibits a number of sonic ideas. Irabagan admitted that in the time leading up to the recording, he had been listening deeply to saxophonist Sonny Rollins. He was also exploring cellular, cellular improvisational ideas and motivic concepts. So Irabagan proposed that they play one long track and develop on the fly a resource bank of motivic ideas and rhythms that we can, that we can draw on as we go. The process was that we would each begin with one phrase or rhythm that we, that we did not, not discuss beforehand, and then, <clears throat> and then that phrase or rhythm would develop into another one, and so forth, each one introducing more material, but allowing one to go back to the earlier phrases or, or rhythms as the piece developed. Nothing was preconceived. The motivic ideas had to develop organically out of where I started from, and of course, I was interacting with another musician at the same time. I wanted the challenge that I encountered in those contexts because it made me play differently and challenged me to respond, grow, and reach for new ideas and concepts in the music. I spent months of practice, work, uh, of practice time working on this idea. It involved not just playing, but also memory. Here I've gone further to describe the process. I had to learn to step aside of what I was doing in the midst of the action and take a snapshot whenever I crystallized an idea that became number two, number three, and so forth. It took many months practicing to be able to do this fluidly. It was the beginning of a mind-blowing process on how to do it in real time. A whole new way of thinking about music making for me. The process has had a deep impact on my other music when I play straight ahead jazz or pop or other improvisational groups. It ended up being transformational. The music is democratic, as you're rather going to explain. I may be the one that organizes gigs, tours, and recording dates. But I, don't tell anyone what to, but I don't tell anyone what to do in the music. We figured that out together. With the music emerging out of sessions and later in live gigs at Death by Audio and a few other venues, such as Goodbye Blue Monday and Zebulon, Urabagan began to get interested in adding a third musician to the concept. After performing at the Moors Festival with his trio on the same bills, Mick Barr's Orth Realm in 2011, Urabagan was immediately drawn to the former's playing and asked him to join the project. I was mesmerized by Mick Barr's playing. I'd never seen anyone play like that. I don't think anyone, no one else does play like that. <laughs> uh, I knew I wanted, wanted him to play with us immediately upon seeing him. Instead of asking Barr to do the cellular concept that the duo had developed, it just had Barr be a, quote, free agent within the music. Free playing and interacting with the Rob Gunn and Pride as he wished while they played. Barr's articulation on the guitar has few parallels, if you're Rob Gunn observed. Sometimes he forms a kind of blanket with waves of sound that Mike and I could use to experiment off of. Or sometimes he would play a section of crisp 16th notes played at the fastest possible pace uh, that would push the energy about as high as I could imagine. His sound makes the band so much more versatile and expands the possibilities massively. I Don't Hear Nothing But the Blues with Barr was featured at the Moors Festival in 2012. Years later, they would, uh, they would add guitarist Ava Mendoza to, to further expand on the sound for their second, or sorry, for their third record, edging louder, noisier, and maximalist as they evolved uh, in their sound and aesthetic. In reflecting on the centrality of Death by Audio to, to the development of the band, Irabagan stated, as someone who comes from the jazzier side of things, Death by Audio was critically important to me and for a lot of creative musicians because it was something definitively different and was a rare intersection between improvised music and rock, punk, black metal, and noise. The venue was so important for musicians to feel comfortable uh, to create and to work in this sonic zone where ticket sales were not an issue and we were given free reign. The most important thing was the community there that supported what we, were, what we and others were doing. So, um, so anyway, I think I'd love to have Weasel and John join me. Um, Okay. Let's talk. I'd love to join you. Let's talk soon. How are you? Hi, John. Hello. Nice to see you. You live in Chicago. Where are you at? You guys need a band. Like, like. Oh, boy. Here we are. So, yeah. New York expatriates in Chicago. It's exciting stuff. Yeah, so anyway, thank you guys both for. First of all, thank you for you know, to you know, join me for the conversation, and also I'm really excited to hear you guys play. So. Yeah, cool. Thank I've you. seen you both play quite a few times, but I don't think I've ever seen you play together. So, good point. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I first saw John play with um, mostly other people.
people do the killing back probably around 2007 or something like that. I used to, I mean, it's funny because you're talking about the whole warehouse thing early on in Williamsburg. And I think my first gigs there in that kind of setting was probably 2001 or something like that with the Flying Lutenbachers. And it was just like, it was obvious that things were shifting to Brooklyn, but I have to say Williamsburg was pretty gnarly back then. I mean, it was pretty gross. And I remember playing at like pretty busted out kind of like warehouse stuff where it seemed, it seemed kind of New York-y like, oh, this is kind of dangerous and I can't park the van any place. And like, what the fuck is going on? I mean, but you know, fast forward to 2000, like the late half of the 2000s. I mean, that's when I started coming to New York more. Um, I was playing with people like Peter Evans, and Mary Halverson, and yes, my MySpace friend, Mark Edwards. And, <laughs> but I saw you playing with uh, Peter Evans for the first time, probably about 2007, I think, something like that. There's a lot of musicians in New York. Yeah. Well, also, what I thought was interesting about your book is that I didn't know half of the musicians in that book. And I mean, it's not like I know everything, but it, it, it also shows you how big um, New York is in terms of even underground activity. I mean, all this stuff is not mainstream at all. It's just people doing their thing. Like, um, it was definitely a lot cheaper to live there at that point. Yeah. But uh, it also came with danger and dirtiness and all these kinds of things. So. Well, I mean, it, it's crazy. I, I mean, I didn't know about half of this. Sure. And going in, I probably didn't. I probably knew a quarter. Yeah, there's whole scenes yeah. that I never even knew existed, and that's kind of like the magic of that is that in New York, at a lot of times, there's multiple crazy scenes going on that don't even acknowledge each other, or know each other exist. There's people playing in the same idiom that have never heard of each other. I mean, the joke is now if you talk to somebody in New York, you're like, "Hey, you heard of this person?" They're like, "No," and you ask that person if they've heard of them, they're like, "No." <laughs> you know, we're just one of like thousands of people trying to like do this stuff in New York. It's pretty crazy. That's the beauty of it. Sure so John, when did you when did you come to Brooklyn? Or... So, well, actually, I, during this this whole period, I was, never, living, I was living in Queens. You lived in Queens. You're one of the Queens too. I lived you in and, Queens. You and Peter lived there too. But yeah, yeah. I lived a few blocks from Peter, and I lived in Queens for eleven years or something, eleven or twelve years, and then. I moved to Brooklyn like way later, like when Williamsburg was already transformed. So for me, coming from Astoria, it was like, am I going to make it back to Astoria the night after I went to Williamsburg? Like, it, was, it was crazy. Wow, yeah. But it was, uh, but as the book talks about, like the music that was happening down there was this completely other thing. So I had to go there regularly. It was, it was a lot of subway time, but it was worth it. Would you, get, you remember what, like, what venues did you guys go to when you first were kind of there in the early 2000s? Or, or when Zebulon was a big one? Zebulon. Zebulon. Yeah. Zebulon was these two brothers that um, they wanted to have like a, their idea was kind of like based on like a 60s jazz club where people like sit at tables and kind of hang and drink and like all hell breaks <laughs> loose. Because really when, when my crew was there, all hell broke loose. I mean, we were jumping on the tables and they, those guys just sat back there and like, ha 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 ha. They were guys. They were yeah, they, were, they, wanted, they wanted to keep New York kind of like this old school thing that they thought was cool about it, which was um, Zebulon was the Williamsburg dive bar pretty much. And I mean, they, let the craziest shit happen in there. I mean, it's another example of where it was like, you know, you could do this crazy stuff and still get like 30 people in there, you know, enough to like pay the bar, you know, tab, like enough to get paid a little money, all hell breaks loose. I mean, there was definitely a lot of improvised music in that place. Are they involved in the LA one? Yeah. They are. It's they, I mean, they eventually, I think they closed up in New York in like 2012, I think, and then moved out. Yeah, I mean, they, they basically, the thing was, they just couldn't, pay the rent anymore. And I think part of the thing with having a venue in New York is that um, the overhead can be really high. And I think there's a background of like organized crime with a lot of this stuff. What? Like if you're at a living, yeah, <laughs> oh, like, like all these Manhattan venues, like, oh, they're making ends meet by selling drinks. Okay. <laughs> right. No. Something else is going on. I mean, New York is like, it's still the Wild West, it's just in, it changes how it's the Wild West as time goes on. I think it's a little more, it's, um, 
I mean, I we could talk about why I left real quick. Sure, I mean, yeah. I just saw the walls closing in. I just saw like, you know, wow, I this is not sustainable for me. I come from a working class background and I've never made much money. Um, this place is turning kind of into uh, like upper class vacation resort and I guess who doesn't fit there? Me. So um, it, it wasn't real, um, it wasn't terribly uh, melancholic for me. It was like at one point I was just like, what the fuck am I doing here? This is not working. I was there for 13 years. You know, I did a lot of stuff and I kind of did everything I set out to do, but um, I mean, there's just, there's such a huge background of money there. If you're not part of that, good fucking luck. It's not like it used to be in terms of try real hard and be good and <laughs> get a fan base. I mean, I wish it was like that, but that doesn't seem to be the dynamic. So I'm not sitting here crying about it. Um, people go to New York because they want to try to do stuff. And that's the reason why it's there. And the best of them leave eventually. I mean, we, we know Roscoe Mitchell, we were just talking about him. He was in New York for a while and after a while he was like later and moved to like a farm outside of Madison. That doesn't make Roscoe Mitchell inferior at all. I mean, the guy's a living legend, you know? I mean, New York is kind of like, if you're not from there, you kind of go there to try to do something. And maybe it pans out and you stay there forever, or maybe you go, all right, I'm gonna go do the next thing. That was kind of like where I got to with it. It was like, all right, you have done about all I can do here. It's time to do the next thing, so. But at Williamsburg, those years, those couple of years in there, mm -hmm. Like, so I was living in Astoria, like, super cheap, because I needed to do that. But those, like, those venues, like the Zebulon thing, and, you know, even, like, the Goodbye Blue Monday, not, not right in Williamsburg, like, the venues became a place where, like, oh, I, don't, I don't know who's playing in Zebulon tonight, but it's going to be something awesome. Yeah. So, so there would be 30 people, or 50, or 70, or something, that would come to Zebulon on a Tuesday night just because they knew it was going to be something. And, and it takes a second to build that, and it takes not, it takes a neighborhood in transition. And Williamsburg was that for those years. Well, the, there were, I think there were so many artists living there that, you know, there was a built-in audience to some degree just from within the artist community. That's my sense. I mean, I wasn't living there in those oh. years, but, you know, I mean, just having so many people living within, I don't know, a couple of miles of each other. I think part of the scene dynamic is that there, there has to be some kind of like aspiration or brass ring. Like when we talk yeah. about people just showing up to like hang in Zebulon, people are like, oh, the cats are gonna be there, let's just go hang out, you know? Like you said, it didn't, sometimes it was, you were going there for a specific thing, but other times it was like, eh, we're gonna all go to Zebulon tonight, we're gonna raise hell, and everyone would go, and maybe you'd see some crazy band, yeah. you know, that you had no idea of, and that's, that's when a scene really, um, the drinks are cheap, the cover's low, it's open late, um, <laughs> the cats are there, the music's kind of like happening. I mean, that's that's a scene dynamic. I mean, I've been through this up and down over 35 years, so it's like I expect it to go away at some point. I mean, it's not sustainable because then you get into the economic factors of scenes, which you know that's that's huge. Maybe the hugest aspect is the economics because if you don't have time to fuck around and stay up until four in the morning, your scene is probably not going to be that exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I gotta say, I think a lot of the book, I, I didn't think this going in, I thought I was just going to be writing about music venues, you know, maybe talking a little bit about gentrification, but it, I tried to weave in economics into it, isn't, you know, maybe it's subtle, I'm not sure if it's subtle, I, I, I'm like, I can't tell anymore I'm reading my own work. Well, it's but, a bummer to talk about it like it matters, <laughs> but it really does, I mean, especially in New York, I mean, just because real estate is such a premium there, I mean, there's some conjecture that a lot of the buildings in like there's a lot of buildings in Manhattan that aren't even occupied. They're, they're placeholders for wealth. They're like NFTs or something. Like I own this building in Manhattan. Empty. Like New York's very complex. Yeah, the, the, just the unbridled develop, development. I mean, it's just it's there's money at stake. I mean, I moved to Bushwick around was it 2013 or 14 or something? Because I I wanted to be around that scene. And within, I would say, about, probably about a year after I got there, suddenly every block had new development. Like when I moved there, it seemed like a gritty neighborhood. People would, just told me they were surprised I had moved there. Like it was just, you know, like you get, I almost got like funny reactions to it. 
and then a year later, it's like every you know there were people getting evicted from buildings and sure. you know like developments going. Well, crazy. Death by Audio, the, which you talked about when you mm -hmm. began reading, mm -hmm. um, closed in 2014, and it got supplanted by um, Vice, the the, the the what what do you want to call it? The conglomerate called Vice bought the whole building and was like, get the fuck out. So Kicked out Vice, several Vice was kind of posing as like a, a cultural influence, yet they were basically getting rid of the actual cultural influence, which is the way gentrification works a lot of time. It's like those who who um, vie to be the center of the cultural lexus wind up displacing the people that actually fucking created the culture. And, and, and like, you can be bitter about that all day, but it's just cyclic. I mean, it's almost inevitable in most cases. So if you're gonna cry about it, I mean, it's kind of pathetic, actually. It's just kind of like almost expected. I mean, well, what can you say? The only way you could do it is maybe buy the damn building, but then you've got to deal with all the politics of that, the mafia, you know, like brutality, like, ah, uh, you know. So, I mean, Death by Audio rented a space, and they also built guitar pedals and electronics, and that was kind of their front was that, oh, we're like, you know, engineers and built this stuff, and meanwhile, we got this venue in the back. Where this crazy shit is happening seven nights a week, you know. It was, to me, it's amazing it lasted seven years, and yeah. that Zebulon lasted, I think, eight or nine years. I mean, those are two venues that I should say there. There are six chapters in the book. One of them has to do with that by audio, and two of them are on Zebulon. And they, so you know, I, I spent a lot of time on those venues, partly because there, there's just better records. I could find better records on those venues, yeah. but but even so, it's because they lasted a long time and they had a huge impact. You know, it's funny for me, I, I was living in Queens that whole time, and then I started uh, dating this girl, and we moved in together, and she was like, oh, I, got, I have to live in Brooklyn, because I'm working down there. So I'm like, cool, I'm gonna finally move down to Brooklyn, and it was 2014. <laughs> so all these places were, were completely gone by the time I finally uh, left Queens. This book ends in 2014. Yeah, that's <laughs> when I, hello, I'm in Brooklyn. Oh wait, everything's gone. Most of my fun ended in 2014. <laughs> It was much more intermittent, let me tell you. I don't know, but um, yeah, Death by Audio closing was a big blow, and it was well publicized, and the irony of, of the last concerts at Death by Audio was a lot of people who never really played there played there and kind of like decided they were gonna be like, yay, Death by Audio, and it's like, you never fucking played there. I played there like, <laughs> like five times a month. What the fuck are you doing? Oh, John Zorn shows up. He never played there. Oh, yay. Co-opting something else. Sorry, did I say that? Oops. Whatever, John. Go on. Well, I'm actually I hope you're watching. <laughs> I'm actually curious if anyone, if any, if there are any questions from the audience <laughs> who do want to probably get on to the music. <laughs> any? I had to get that big in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any questions? <laughs> the, the book ends with like a ten-page rant about the lack of funding for the arts. And, <laughs> and, well, there's still funding for the arts, but you know, it helps if you've been trained by your rich parents to go get all the resources for yourself. Well, I did. Did I say that again? I put in a line. I tried to be subtle about a beer here. I did put in a line where I basically say, not only did the, the did the city gentrify, but so did the music. So, I mean, it's right there. I'll do a drum hit on that later. Yeah. Well, you know, this is once again like to be melancholy or, or pathetic about it is is not looking towards the future, I mean, the future is, all right, like, your little golden, your little rose garden is gone, like, all right, now you're doing your thing, like, what's next? And I, and I think John thinks the same way, it's like, all right, yeah, that happened, and there were some cool times, and, you know, there were opportunities, and there will be more opportunities, and we'll do more stuff, so, like, yeah, what's next, you know? It's being, being like a non, well, being any kind of artist, I think, is, is a real roller coaster. You don't just, uh, flat line up through success and just, yeah, keep going. I mean, you, you gotta kind of like bend with the times. And it's just exciting that, you know, there, we've been part of these little pockets of activity right. that were like really stimulating and maybe had like a long-term effect or a wide influence or something like that. And, you know, and it'll come along again at some point, someplace else, you know, it always does. Well, you were saying, you know, what's next? I, I think, you know, it doesn't have to happen in New York. No. You know, like, I actually don't... Probably won't. I, I think a decade from... I don't know. I'm, this is probably going to get me in trouble with New York people, but... You know, like, I, I don't... You're already in trouble, don't worry. <laughs> I don't... I mean, I... I don't think... You know, I don't think... 
we're in the era anymore where, I mean, I feel like in the past, a lot of people felt like, okay, at some point they had to go to New York. Whether or not that was even true then, but I, I just think it's less and less true over time. I mean, the, there is a certain kind of media there, I think, that sometimes people try to tap into. Maybe that's what, what it is, but, you know, I, I, the next book that I've been working on looks at the you know, 60s and 70s, early free jazz period, and, I, you know, I, I, I've just constantly been impressed by people creating their own media, you know? Like, I mean, I created jazz right now, and I'm not, it wasn't, like, the biggest, you know, online magazine or whatever, ever, but, you know, like, I got to the point where I felt like I had a, built up a pretty good readership. I just used WordPress and created a site. I'd never done it before. I, you know, like, I, you know, I feel like, like people can't do that. And I don't think that, that could have happened in any other place. It didn't have to happen in New York. Um, and I mean, I was putting on shows. I remember getting contacted by European musicians who were touring. And they're like, can I play your series? And I'm like, it's, it's happening in my living room. You know? <laughs> but you know, like, you can, I feel like, you can, like people can make things happen. I think there's less and less reason why everything has to happen. Fair, you know, but to be things. honest and to be objective about the New York thing is there's guaranteed a uh, certain level of competition there. Yeah. And that competition puts New York musicians kind of in a limelight automatically, or, or it puts them on a platform that's maybe a little higher than other cities, like automatically just because people pay attention in New York. Mm -hmm. It's very competitive. There's a lot of people vying for the resources there. And um, as such, I think it can kind of lift the music a little bit and make it more competitive. And that's the thing is, it's not to say all the music from New York's good, it's certainly that's not the case, but like still the competition is there. And like, I think a lot of people historically, at least from the 20th century on, went to New York to try to like see if they could raise the bar or try to like push things a little harder or try to yeah. do this and that, you know? And I, I mean, like that's, why I went there. I was dead set against moving to New York, but I just kept going there all the time. I was living in, in Oakland, California at the time. I kept going out to play, and I was like, Jesus, I got all these gigs in New York, and I'm like not doing shit on the West Coast. And I went to my wife, uh, can we move to New York? And she's like, I guess so. And I was like, I can't believe I'm saying this, but it never really got that much easier, to be honest. But like, I was just like, I'm gonna come here and I'm gonna kick ass and I'm gonna be me and da 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 da. And I did it and I kept banging my head against the wall and then finally blood just started pouring out. I was like, ah, maybe I don't need to be here anymore. So I don't know. I mean, I'm less active because I'm not in New York. I mean, there's a million gigs in New York. If you want to, if you want to play every day, you could easily do that. Not to say anyone will show up, but you can do it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I mean, the audiences in New York are, are certainly no better than they are in other cities. I feel generally, like well, sometimes they're worse. You've got you've got sometimes they're worse. people who go out, but there's also more gigs. So I mean, you know, sometimes there's like five or six things happening every night. Sure, yeah, and and I mean, I I think when I lived there, I had geez, three, four gigs a week, almost like continually for a lot of the time, and some of them were you know well attended. A lot of the improvised music gigs were small attendance, but it was almost like predictable. It was like a scene in itself. There were people who documented it and showed up and stuff. And like, if you're playing free improvisation, I mean, come on. You know, if you've got five people there, seven people there, 10 people there, you're doing fucking great because you're just making it up as you go along, right? People are actually coming out to see that, pretty cool. So, I mean, you know, like it's whatever, man, you know? I mean, I went there to do the thing. I didn't really go there to be like, if I go to New York, I'm gonna be famous. Like, I wasn't, yeah. I didn't care about that. I just wanted to do the thing. Sure. And that was the place to do the thing for a while. Now, I don't feel like it is for me. Maybe it is for somebody else. So you don't have any questions? We should get at least <laughs> one question from the audience. So many. <laughs> yes, please. Yeah, I, I'm interested in uh, the sort of like process of, especially you mentioned a lot of these places were like illegal or in sort of underground. So, yeah. what is the process for you of trying to like map these locations that existed for a short amounts of time uh, and like the like getting in touch with you said over 180 people? Like, what was the process of finding all these people, finding these locations that no longer exist? Uh, what was that like for you? Yeah, well, so the first two years really was the, I would kind of call it the gritty research, right? I, spent, I literally just had a Word document where I was um, compiling all of the shows I could find on any zine or newspaper or website or whatever. 
to reconstruct basically what happened in the most basic sense. Um, and that, you know, for that I just, I, I did a ton of online research, I, I looked through... You asked me. I, I did. I Weasel. See, I've written down all 2,500 gigs I've played since 1991. I have see, everything. This is a historian's dream because I mean, so, there's like a small number of people who do that, yeah. and that's amazing. And that means they're gonna. I think it's just way better documentation. I just handed it over. I was like, here you go, baby. He sent me the whole thing. I remember. I just I remember being, you know, like, <laughs> this is like what, what you wish everybody did. Wow. Um, you know, so like, you just peck away at it as you know. Did. I mean, I would. Just, I had a few interviews where I, you know, I asked people, like, well, "What did you do?" And they're like, "I don't remember." Yeah. Did you keep any records? No. Like, okay, well, then we're, you know, yeah. A lot of my right. peers, like, their biggest regret is that they didn't write down their gigs. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, like, I think the the process to me was really complex that way in terms of just spending like a lot of time, just like you know, just trying to make sure I did my homework in that way. I took like the New York City Jazz Record, which put a lot of, you know, listed a lot of shows. I got PDFs of all those, so I could, they were searchable, so I could like just like put in like you know John or Robin, and it's like oh okay you know like you know like give me every single hit in that uh, that issue. So like stuff like that, which you know I just I just was kind of a crazy nerd doing that kind of thing. Um, and then you know I, I reached out to the people that I knew initially. I mean like you know, I, I interviewed you know people that I knew, and then I, it just one of, it was like a snowball thing. And the, I mean, the funny very last interview is I, I called saxophonist Darius Jones, and he never called me back. And I, you know, I, was like, well, I should respect his privacy. I'm not, I'm not going to bug him about it. And a year later, he calls me frantic, and he said, "I just heard your message on my on my voicemail." <laughs> like That's literally, super Darius Jones. What? And he's like, "Are you, are you still doing? You still want to do the interview?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." So we did the interview, and like, I think I literally sent the book off like a couple weeks later. Wow. <laughs> anyway, so you know. I felt like I tried. I would try to pick off pieces. Like, oh, okay, I'm going to look at this particular venue. I'm going to interview the people. And you'll notice. I think if you read it, you would see that the earlier chapters probably have a little bit less detail. Because I just, you know, like I think the, especially the first chapter. Actually, I would say really the first chapter because the amount of media that I could find was just way less. Yeah, exactly. Like it. Like that's the, more that's less. when I read that book. I was like, who the hell are these guys? And I was like, oh, they. Like, don't even have records or anything. They're yeah. just doing the thing. They were creating the action in the scene or whatever. I mean, there were some cool punk artists. There were a few people that put out records, but there was like a lot of people that just didn't record. I think pre digital or pre, really honestly, like pre 2000, sort of that, you know, early 2000s, before that, people just didn't record as much. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I, I have to admit, I sometimes feel like now things are over documented <laughs> to a certain level. Oh, yes. But, you know, you could say a lot of people there were then were underdocumented. I mean, there were there were a few like local Williamsburg uh, record labels. Uh, what was it Coyote Studios? I think it was one of them, or Coyote Records, or whatever it was called. But I mean, there was just, there were a ton of artists that just never got recorded. Or you know, you might find just a few really rough tapes. You know, that were it wasn't done in the studio. You know, and I I asked a lot of musicians who had private archives. I just would dig through their tapes, go through post like old posters or flyers, or even have like people who had kept their old calendars, you know, like you know, like calendar books where you put all your appointments. I went through those. I mean, and it, you know, it's uneven. You know, I mean, like you know, Weasel gave me a whole bunch of stuff. Jessica Bavone gave me a whole bunch of stuff. Andrew Barker had a whole bunch of stuff. And the, but then there were people who had nothing, and so you know, it made it. It was a challenge. It took me. Also, like just lots of different kinds of like resources that you're trying to. Kind of integrate into some sort of. We want to see the spreadsheet, man. You want to see the. I want to see the spreadsheet <laughs> really bad. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. Yeah, no, I actually want to make it public. I just have never figured out how to do that. Some kind of database thing. Yeah, I'm yeah. terrible with that stuff, but if, if anyone knows anyone who knows anything about data, I would love to mm -hmm. take that and put it on, somehow put it online. Okay, noted. But, but, and it's really pretty detailed from about 98 on. Yeah, so it was, I mean, it's an incredible amount of stuff, and it also, I mean, it would give me like a sense of like, oh, this band played like 37 times, and not that I'm just weighing that, I mean, that's not the only thing that matters, but to get a sense of like activity level, yeah. you know, like, and at, from the beginning I thought like the book isn't about the most famous people who played at one of these venues once or twice, like, you know, like, I, I admired Marshall Allen to, to, like, to such an amazing degree, but like, he, like, I wasn't gonna write about Marshall Allen, like this was a, like because he's a completely different generation. You know what I mean? So do he played at Zebulon. Do you have a map of the 
the venues in there? I can't remember. There is. There's, there's a map. map right? There's okay. there's the early '90s map. Right. There's the I think right around the Millennium map, and then there's the post 2005 when everything got rezoned and, and everything started getting gentrified. And that stuff. Okay. So the the maps are yeah a lot of a lot of work on those maps. So it's yeah. Fun. Cool. Hey, maybe we should get on the music. What do you think? Du, 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 du. But um. Yeah. All right. Uh, I guess we're gonna set up and play. Yeah. Okay. So sick. let's do it. So anyway, yeah. thank you all for coming out. Thanks. 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 Thanks.